Good evening, golf friends, and welcome to our webinar series, Tuesday Traces. The purpose of this webinar is to show how the V1 pressure mat is used by some of our most exceptional industry partners. Welcome to everyone that registered um, via the Zoom webinar, and welcome to everyone that's tuned in via the Facebook Live channel. Please feel free to put questions in either the chat window on Zoom or the Facebook channel, um, and the girls will send them through, and I'll ask Jake. Also, the recording of tonight's webinar will be available on our, our YouTube channel. Um, if you find V1 Sports and you search Pressure Mat, there are 32 recordings that Anna has edited. They're all there. They're all awesome. I would suggest go looking at them. You can also find the other ones that Jake and I have posted together, um, all which were great and have really good information. A little bit about who we are, if you don't already know. V1 Sports is a 25, I guess I should say now 26-year-old company and the leader in delivering video analysis and instruction solutions to golfers and golf instructors around the world. We are extremely passionate about supporting your golf business in any way. If you need help, please call us. Um, I am Mandy Von C. I am the Southeast Regional Sales Manager for V1 Sports, born, and raised, and based in Charleston, South Carolina. I support golf instructors and golfers by providing video analysis software and hardware for golf studios, including my favorite technology, as you all know, the V1 Pressure Mat. Tonight, I'm really excited because I get to host from Sumter, South Carolina. We are helping uh, consult and build golf academies. Our very first cement pour is happening tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. So this afternoon, I was over at Coyote Golf Club looking at the conduit runs. They look perfect, and they are going to have a beautiful, shiny new academy in a few months. But first, tonight, I'm thrilled to be hosting my 33rd Tuesday Trace with the OG, my friend, pressure mat expert, Jake Thurm. Jake, thank you so much for joining me on our fourth, fifth, whatever it is, webinar. And I'm so happy to have you. Mandy, every time I think I know the answers, you change all the questions. So well, I have to keep I'm you happy to be here. I have to keep you on your toes. That's the way it goes. We may ask the same questions a little differently, but we're definitely going to pick your brain about uh, ground pressure tonight. And I'm really excited that you shared your time. I know it's a really busy time of year for you. Um, okay, so a little bit about Jake. You guys all know he's a rock star, but let's talk about some of his credentials. He has formerly been named one of the best young teachers in America <laughs> by Golf Digest for three consecutive years. If you don't know I'm a cut at, you will now. Jake is formerly the Golf Digest best young teacher because he is now 41. So he can't yeah. win it anymore, although I'm sure that he would if he were not in his 40s. So we'll yeah, talk it, it, as they say in the commercial, no play for Mr. Gray. So well, I hey, aged out. Right. I'm done. That's all right. That's all right. I, uh, if I were a golf instructor, I wouldn't be able to win the best young teacher anymore either. So there you go. And I'm happy to say that live on the webinar. Highly regarded in Chicagoland golf circles, Jake is the Midwest director for the USA Junior National Golf Team and director of the Nike Junior Golf Club, golf, bleh, Junior Golf Camp, sorry, at Fresh Meadows Golf Club mm -hmm. in Hillside. He also operates golf schools at Ruffled Feathers and the Athletico Performance Center in Oak Brook. He is very busy. He is the largest Nike Junior Golf Camp and the largest USA Junior Golf Team in the country, and he is definitely an expert on using, utilizing ground force technology in golf instruct, instruction. Um, Jake has also worked with multiple tour players. There is no one that has put more tour players on the pressure mat during tour events than Jake. Um, you guys, seriously, Jake is one of our experts. Please put questions in the chat. This is a really great opportunity. And if you, any question, no question is, is silly. No question is dumb. Please send it through. We want them all. Okay, Jake, speaking of tour players, and I didn't want to ask you about it until everyone was tuned in. How about Petro? I mean, are you kidding? Let's talk yeah, about yeah. what, a, what we so, texted on Sunday. It was an exciting couple, few minutes. <laughs> Tell us about so, what you think. Yeah, so I've been working with uh, Tim Petrovic now for, it was actually after um, the PGA show last year, I went down to uh, Naples because I run a golf school at Calusa Pines. Um, I usually go down there to work with uh, Dudley Hart. Um, then there's always some other random tour players there that'll probably kick the tires or pick your brain a little bit. But uh, the, last year it was there uh, for, not only for Dudley, but for Scott Gregory, who was the British Amateur champ. He plays on the European tour. And that, anyways, I met Petrovic then. Um, I actually gave his father a golf lesson and he watched the whole thing. And nice. then he, he, yeah. 
his uh, and his his dad's such just such a great guy. And uh, he watched the whole thing, and then he's like, "I think you should be my coach." So, um, been working with him for over a year. Um, it, you know, we we really know how to finish in the top six on the Champions Tour. <laughs> We're hoping to get a win <laughs> soon, but uh, and late. I mean, our our worst finish I think in two thousand twenty one is six. And we've had a couple of thirds, a couple of seconds, and so on and so forth. So we'll tell everybody about it, Sunday, right? Yeah. I mean, come on. So oh, well, so here's the thing. I didn't see any of it because I was at my family pictures. So oh, uh, my, my, phone, so my phone my phone. I'm glad was I was giving you the play by play. <laughs> yeah. So and, and I am very guilty of this. When any of my players are near the lead, like I remember I was at Ice Capades and I kept it refresh, refresh. Now, before you think I'm a lousy uh, uh, father. I'm going to point out I was at the ice capades. Okay. So that was like hell. So um, I, uh, anytime uh, my players are near the lead or something, I'm usually hitting refresh, uh, just not on Sunday. So I came back, I left my phone in the car. I came back and it was blowing up, uh, you know, cause John Daly was up there and Mike Weir was up there and uh, a good friend of mine, Mark Blackburn has uh, done an amazing job with Mike Weir. So I was actually, you know what, if it's not us, I'm glad it's them. So um, yeah, it got a little crazy there at the end. Uh, he's just been su shooting super low scores ever since he played with Phil last year. Um, I mean, if people don't know how competitive it is on the Champions Tour, it's it's crazy. Last year, he shot uh, 63, 65, 66, or 67, and lost to Phil by three. So, I mean, it's just crazy competitive out there. Um, those guys can still really play golf. It's amazing. And um yeah, so I, I've used all the technology that I have in my possession at his disposal, uh, and it's uh, really been uh, eye-opening for him, and I think what he enjoys about the relationship, obviously, um, we're in the results business, but I think what he enjoys about it is we are using this technology, but I convey the message quite simply. Um, he has an athletic, Petrovic uh, was a college baseball player, so he always kind of gravitates towards baseball. So when I talk to him about his golf swing, there's videos of us, like me pitching range balls to him. Uh, I've done that on a uh, V1 pressure mat and so on and so forth. So he's just an athlete and he doesn't, uh, he doesn't want to hear the big words um, that I can't spell anyways. So it's been a really good relationship for the past year and uh, he's doing a great job. I love that. So specifically about the pressure mat and for the instructors that have tuned in, super important what Jake just said. Um, the instructor can get a whole lot of really technical data and feedback from this technology. What you give your student is a whole different ball game, right? You might say, okay, I'm looking at this pressure and I'm going to, I'm going to do this drill because I want them to get here. You might not actually tell them what the dynamic vertical force is at impact, right? And what that pressure is, but you might use it for your benefit and give it to your student in a way that makes a big difference in a golf swing. Um, is it possible yeah. to see Tim's swing or pressure yeah. do you mind yeah. to share that and you know while you pull that up jake I, my question is you teach okay. and everyone the audience you teach a lot of juniors and, and some tour players james hahn uh tim yep. petrovic petro is on the champions tour is there something that you see with pressure that is dramatically different from the juniors to let's say the seniors uh yeah you can still hear me right yep we can so totally hear you and we can okay. see that your screen share is happening. It's happening. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. They, so juniors, um, I'm a big advocate of, of club fitting and I've got some prepared here. I've got some other tour players and I, uh, an LPGA um, cool. uh, lady that I work with as well, but we'll start with Petrovic, obviously. Um, yeah. With juniors, um, usually what you're going to say, I, I'm such an advocate of club fitting because I've seen so many junior traces, especially ones where clubs are too long or too heavy for them. Um, so my, uh, I know some instructors are on here that we've already said hi to, but I also know a lot of golfers are on there. And if I had advice for golf parents, it would be to not buy clubs like my mom bought shoes for me at Payless, right? She'd be like, <laughs> ah, you'll grow into them right? That's what they wiggle your toe. Ah, you'll grow into them. Uh, with golf clubs, I prefer they grow out of them. And even if they are a little short, at least they'll swing them fast. And the only, the only issues they really develop is postural. Um, the reason I say that is because when you put kids uh, with clubs that don't fit on the V1 pressure mat, you are just going to inherently see a ton of 
uh, vertical force, but the, but the vertical force, which again, sounds good if you say it fast, the problem is that they're not doing it for distance necessarily. They're doing it for correction, okay? Mm. And then you're seeing a lot of backup, uh, especially with the irons, uh, the pressure trace moving backwards, just because they're not strong enough in their physical stature to, to trap that pressure on the lead side. So um, yeah, it, that would be the two most common things you see with juniors. Um, and then uh, obviously uh, the, this, this is what will be cool about it, if I can pull it up here. So let's go like this and then let's go like this. Okay, and you guys, just in case you don't know, this is Tim Petrovic, tour player, um, who came in second on Sunday on the 18th yeah. who is Jake's um, student, if you don't recognize Yeah, so it, well, and, <laughs> how, who couldn't recognize those legs, right? Um, <laughs> well, don't so, tell him we, we won't tell him we said that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, what I thought would be cool, and uh, I, hey, I'm getting a lot of questions about him, and it's very flattering. Um, because uh, he's put on uh, about six, seven miles an hour, and everybody wants to know, like, you know, what's the magic, what's the sauce here? Because he is 54 years old. Um, he moves really well. He has no injuries, uh, nothing. We're going to keep him that way. But um, so, uh, it, as always, it's a lot of little things that grow up to be big things um, in terms of seven miles an hour. But if I was going to target something in particular, I would talk about how we, uh, how we started using his pelvis during the swing. And it's pretty, mis uh, it's unmistakable here. This is actually one of the first times I got him on the V1 pressure mat. And then I have his trace later too. But, um, and I, with all these tour players, I also love to use uh, training aids or drills and then to verify it with his ground reaction force uh, it, that he creates. So the one on the bottom is the before. So if we're just watching that, and again, he's, <laughs> he was really good before he met me. So it's not like this is bad, right? So right. Uh, gets in the heel and then he would always transition out towards the toe and then try to rebound. And uh, so we, we have commonly referred to this in the past as a fish hook trace. He would show this all through the bag, especially with the driver, it would just become more pronounced. Okay, and then, Jay, really quickly. Yeah. Let me, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just for everyone who is new, when Jake is saying a fish hook trace, he is looking at the yellow line that is kicking around as he plays that. So we diagnose, there are 12 traces. Some of them have, uh, we have named them. So Jake, Jake diagnosed the bottom as the fish hook trace. And that's the yellow line that we're looking at. Sorry, go ahead, Jake. Yeah, and, and for those that are new to this, basically you're gonna see a, a, a fish hook trace when a guy uh, loses the depth in his hips. So in other words, something that you, a lot of instructors always do on the V1 app here, which is what I'm doing, is you put a little, uh, we'll call it the tush plane, right? And then uh, what you see is they'll, they'll move off that. The funniest thing is that process already started long before you actually witness it on the, uh, the, on the video. So that's what I tried to convey to him. Um, you know, it, it's very interesting when you're talking about how the hips actually work in the swing because absent the ground, they would work in the opposite direction. Um, you know, we can go forever in a day in that. But basically what that means is how you grip the ground and how to utilize it is actually is what's going to propel your hips in the direction that we're used to seeing, right, the pelvis. So, um, and I kind of like to, to prove the validity of uh, of drills. I mean, guys, guys are not going to do drills just to do them that they, they need, you need to, you need to up the buy-in factor. You need to prove it to them that it's a good drill for them again. So you can see right after impact here, he's well off there. He's lost the depth in his hips and uh, it started with getting pressure in the toes. So when the pressure goes in the toes, that means that the pelvis is moving out towards the ball. Okay. And that extends his upper body as a way of counterbalancing away from it. So this is an, it's an oldie, but a goodie. I think I made Brian, um, when, uh, when we did the OG TT, uh, I think I made Brian, the CEO of uh, V1, put a chair. And the funniest thing is I got killed for that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I was totally fine with it because here's the thing, you can always check to see the validity of anything that you give a client immediately. And you know what, if it doesn't work, don't do it. So I put uh, this little fence uh, for the tush plane. I don't need to draw a line there. And you could see, especially on the through trace, right? 
And again, this is last year, especially on the through trace. It goes basically riding those crosshairs all the way into the lead side and, and then into the mid foot right there. And you could see he's pushing on that. You saw that thing move a little bit oh, too, yeah. right? Yeah. So I, I always give him like the, I always give the uh, Petro like, I, I told him there's two stacks of books, one behind your right uh, rear and one behind your left rear. I go, I want you to nudge the books on the backswing and then I want you to knock them over on the through swing. And that kind of, that image kind of works for him right there. Um, so uh, the, the funniest thing is if I get rid of this, you'd see he's almost about to fall over. Um, again, I only show before and afters that make me look really smart. Where the other one here up here, he looks very balanced. So um, that's just a good example of one drill. So if you guys, and again, the, the term is early extension, all the instructors out there already knew that. So if you're seeing someone battle with early extension, I promise you that the pressure is getting in their toes and it depends on their handicap level. It very could indeed be on the downswing, uh, usually if it's a better player, because they probably got too deep in their right heel to begin with, which kind of kicked it out that way. Um, but uh, at the higher handicap players that battle with early extension are really actually pressuring the toes in the backswing. So um, that's when they start losing their posture and it happens, that process happens much earlier. And as you can see, quite easy to see with the V1 pressure map. Right, and so that was gonna be my, my next challenge, you know, question to challenge you. How do you see that without a pressure map, Jake? Um, so you certainly can draw the lines on there um, we, we use, uh, again, there, I, there's a lot of various technologies that I use, uh, 3D suits, so on and so forth. But, but here's the thing. If you're talking about the lower body, and mostly with Petro, all I've done is, is really emphasize dynamic posture and his use of his pelvis. If, if I were to point to one thing, like why is he playing so well and why is he hitting the ball further at, at 54, I would say it's how he's controlled his lo lower center of rotation, his pelvis. And the one thing I would point to is the V1 pressure map because there's not, there isn't a ton of great like lower body things out there. Um, so I always say like the V1 pressure mat is good for diagnosis, but it's also good for training. So uh, in other words, I actually will use the biofeedback option where I play the trace live. And I mean, he's so good that if you just tell him to move someplace uh, somewhere at some time, and he just does it a few times, he'll be able to produce that on the next swing. Um, okay, so by the way, you guys, um, I love the funny name drills and we called that drill Jake, the cheek checker, right? Isn't that cheek the cheek checker. checker? Yeah. Yes. Which my, I uh, love it. My, I, yeah, my 12 year old, uh, my, my 12 year old USA junior kid uh, built uh, something similar to that. And, but it wasn't exactly that. I go, well, we got to come up with a name. And he goes, cheek checker. And I go, I perfect. love it. I love it. You guys, it's whatever works, right? If you're a golf instructor and that is what you want to call it to get your juniors doing the right thing. I love it. Yep. And, you know, Jake, I'd love to capture that verbiage that you used about the books to tap the right cheek and knock the left cheek over. Um, that's a yeah. great visual as well. Yep. Um, and a couple quick questions. Bob Grissett's asking this. I totally love this. Um, do you ever have the folks lift their toes up in their shoes? 100%. Yeah. 100%. And uh, I'll, I'll slowly kind of move on to give people something else to look at. But uh, well, actually, we'll stay on Petro and then we'll go to the other players. Uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, yes, uh, Nick Faldo in particular uh, was somebody to get him to do it in the moment, uh, we told him to raise the toes in his lead foot, which would be his left. He was not wearing squares at that moment in time. But uh, anyways, um, just to give him the feeling of producing the trace. And then uh, what would you have them do when they get really good at it is actually have, have their toes down at a dress and have them lift them up as they make the downswing. Again, the lead toes. Uh, Faldo was, was showing a little bit of a fish hook trace. Um, and again, ball flight, uh, ball flight verified. He was struggling with an inside out club path and the swing direction out to the right. So I felt very justified in giving him the suggestion. So the funniest thing is the story he shared with us is uh, with Hashimoto and I is that from 1989 to 1996, he used to lift his lead toes in his front foot um, in his shoe, 
not lifting the spikes out of ground, just the toes inside the shoe. And he said he never told anyone because he thought it was weird. Um, so, and then I asked him what, and he goes, and I played, I played great, obviously the best of my career. And I said, well, why'd you stop? And he goes, you know, I just, I just forgot I just started working on other things. So, um, so funny, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. It, it wouldn't have been something. He, I mean, if he's only lifting them in his, I mean, you'd notice his movement would become much freer. You'd notice his balance, his dynamic balance would improve, but ultimately, I mean, if he wasn't lifting the, the spikes up out of the ground, even as an instructor looking for it, you wouldn't have known that unless you had measured it. Right. Is this Petrovic or you've got graphs over this person's face? Is that yeah, Petrovic this or Childer? Yeah, so this is, this is fast forward. No, this is the, uh, still Petrovic. And then I got okay. Streelman and all that. So uh, let's see, there he is. There he is, sorry. My, my ginger. All right, so... <laughs> Um, uh, this one was kind of unique for him. He was kind of loading up the, uh, so I, I, so he was able, and this is taken, oh golly, probably six months after. And this was uh, much more recent. And obviously he's gone on a little bit of tear after this. So he, his through trace was actually pretty good. There it is. It's the same trace that we fixed last time. The problem was that instead of, uh, loading the midfoot or perhaps a little bit of the heel, he was loading up the toe a little bit. You can see that end transition at the top. So I liked the through. I didn't like the load. And again, if you're looking at back here, this is cool. So you can see kind of that he maintained probably perhaps a little too much trail knee flex, okay? If you're seeing that. For, for my liking, we, we did measure him on a uh, 3D suit and um, he basically his pelvic rotation was uh, not even in the lower end. And he asked me if that was good. And I said, I had 12 year old girls that turned their hips more than he did. And uh, <laughs> basically again, so good. You'll see up here, he has a shaft in his front two belt loops uh, right there. So all I told him to do was I told him to get the lead side of the shaft down and rotated back more. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'll let this play right here. And you'll be able to see that there is indeed a, you see the shaft right there? Okay, so I told him to get it down and rotate it back more. And then you could see he started loading more into, at least into the midfoot, 55% at the top of the swing. And that now you're starting to see the, the knee flex change, which obviously uh, give him a little bit more uh, tilt or slant of the pelvis. And then we get into that you know, uh, I always say optimal is not personal, but uh, but 55% in the heel where I come from is pretty darn good. So, and then he was able to obviously keep the through trace. He's so much better through the ball than he was in that, that uh, video I sent you previous where he's going straight across and now through impact. And on a linear trace, I get this question a lot. What, you know, what's optimal numbers? And I usually say, I don't really get into optimal numbers, only optimal directions, but if you're a linear trace, you're probably pretty good to have it within 10 to 20% uh, forward, which is that 86 number down there, and in the lead heel right there, uh, especially if you're trying to get someone to maintain their tilts and rotate. So, Okay, real quick, Jake, I'm just going to pause yeah. you really quickly to just, because you threw out some numbers right quick. Um, and this ties into a great question that Marcella asked using the V1 pressure mat. What patterns of pressure are you looking for if an athlete is trying to create more vertical forces and gain more speed? So Jake is pointing out that we like to see pressure moving to the lead edge and the heel. And when he's mentioning the 86, Jake, can you just point that out? What we're talking yep. about when you're looking at the, the, you know, the graph is small, obviously on people's screens. And so patterns that we're looking for, and of course, everyone's different, which you say, um, yep. To answer the question is, you know, what can you just restate that and, and show everyone what numbers you're looking at? Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Yeah. So at the bottom of the center of pressure chart, which is what we're looking at here, is uh, the left and the right, the lead side and the trail side. So um, basically, he's very similar, actually, uh, with the 82 uh, percent there to the 86. I'd say that's fairly close. That's ne negligible. Uh, even these guys will have some sort of variance shot to shot. Um, but you can, you can see we get a little bit more pressure in the heel. And then we just like the general flow of the trace and how it transitioned, um, where it didn't come from out, out of his, uh, his toes and his backswing. 
most uh, most players are going to load their trail heel at some point in the backswing because their trail hip is working behind them. Okay, and if they don't, then they're probably going to lose their posture a little bit. And then you also get into restrictions, which uh, is very easy to see on the V1 pressure mat where the, the flow of the trace is interrupted by restrictions. In this case, it was too much uh, trail knee flex uh, going back and at the top of the swing. So you're squatting. If you're squatting, you'll hit it rotten. How about that? I love it. Uh -huh. um, okay, so the folks love this. They're saying exclamation marks, great drills. How do you get players that slide in the downswing to sl stop sliding? Sure. So um, a, a couple good drills on the, the V1 pressure mat to get them. I'm actually thinking who I got on here right now uh, prepared for you guys tonight. So I'll just answer the question. I don't think I have a video for that, even though I use this a lot. So um, if you want to get a player to stop sliding, uh, a, good tr a good thing to look at on here is especially on a linear trace. So we're, I, I just clicked on the, the center of pressure twice. Now we're on the V chart, which I know a lot of instructors are uneasy about this. I actually love the V chart um, and it's easiest to use for uh, for a linear trace or maybe a scoring club iron trace. So that um, right here, let's get them at impact. So while you're scrolling, yeah. you guys, Jake has tapped his mobile device and he has gotten to the velocity chart. So on the bottom graph, you're looking at the velocity chart, um, which is different than the pressure graph. So that's what he's referring to. He just tapped it to get that second graph to show. Yeah, and whoever asked that question is, uh, that's a great question about lateral slide because you can see a lateral slide on a body track by using the V chart. So that, that you see in that 279 up here, I'm trying to draw a little arrow at it or something, but the 279 has a green line and it kind of goes to the peak right here, okay? That is his, in his velocity chart, that is the fastest he is moving laterally towards the target, okay? Right there at, at or around lead arm parallel is where you'll see most of the elite level players moving their fastest towards, laterally towards the target. After that, it starts to dissipate. It's not that he's not still moving forward. It's that he's not moving forward at as fast a rate because he is now rotating. So when you saw that center of pressure get into the heel, what you'd love to see, especially with this particular type of trace, is you'd love to see that white line of the velocity chart get back down to that median line um, before impact or, or at impact, I should say. Um, and do you so want it often, the highest? Do you want it the highest at the top of the backswing? No. Uh, you want it actually at, in transition. Okay. So um, after transition at around lead arm parallel is when most players, not all, but most will have the highest amount of vertical pressure on the lead foot. Okay. So right there. So he's a little and, late, right? Uh, he, I mean, he's, I, he's lead arm. He's not a lead arm parallel yet. Is he? I can't totally see it. That's probably right there. Okay. So you, you have a keen eye. Yes. One click, but, uh, but ultimately what you're looking for is that. So again, begs, it goes back to the original question. Um, how do you help with the lateral slide? Someone that would be uh, sliding through the ball on a uh, V1 pressure mat would have their peak velocity that, that 279 right there at impact. So their impact would be at their peak velocity because they are still moving at their fastest towards the target and thus unable to rotate and push up from the ground. Okay, so you always want impact well after the peak or as much as you possibly can, because then he will be, uh, the lateral motion towards the target would, uh, will have dissipated and he will be in pure kind of rotary and vertical motion at that point if that makes sense. So if you, if you set impact and you see him right at the peak, then uh, at impact, then that player has slid past the ball. 
Okay. Yeah. So do you ever show this? And we've had people ask about the linear velocity graph. So thank you for talking about it. We've also had someone ask about how does the timing of the arm swing influence the pressure choice that so you're kind of talking about all of this at the same time. But right. do you ever give this velocity info to Tim? Do you ever show him this? Do you ever show no. any of your students this? Okay. No, I, again, I only use words that him and I can both spell together. So, um, no, uh, it, honestly, the most teachable graph, I mean, this one's great too. And, and with verticals they, on a, I believe that was a seven or an eight iron he was setting, uh, they're going to be much lower than say his driver, but the most teachable graph is the one that we let off with the center of pressure. Um, I don't care if they're a 20 handicap or a tour player, they just kind of get what their left foot is and the right foot is. They kind of get what their heel and toe are just by moving on the pressure mat. So um, that comes that comes pretty easy and it's the most teachable graph. I keep my eyes on the other ones, uh, but very rarely do I show that to a player unless, unless they really want to know or they really want to uh, ask for it. Nice. So I love that, that you're, you know, there again, you get a whole bunch of data as an instructor, what you do with it to, or what you give to the student is, you know, you may or not share that, may or may not share that, but it does give you the information to prepare the drills that you want. So right. um, speaking of drills, and do you want to do, do you want to look at another trace, Jake? I, sure. I mean, I love looking at, um, sure. at yeah, yeah. would love to see a junior. Um, I, I only have session. tour players. Sorry, do you? I don't okay. have any juniors on here. Uh, okay. I have a lady. Okay, let's see it. I'd love to see the ladies. Okay, so unfortunately, she's like super lady, but um, let me get that comparing. So I just thought this would be fun to look at. And again, I got another drill. Um, so the top one is a little bit of the before, but that's okay. Um, right now, actually, I'm going to just let it play. And I want you to watch the center of pressure go back and forth, back and forth, which is very evident when Kyle Berkshire, uh, who's a long drive guy, hits a golf ball. But the funniest thing is when we look at her feet, you don't really see her feet moving around too terribly much, right? We'll go back there and we'll kind of look, you know, a little tapping right there, a little shifting, and then it'll kind of stop and then her feet will. So, uh, you know, Hashimoto is keenly called this uh, uh, golf dance. But basically, and uh, my great friend James Light said, uh, has a, a great saying, so I have to give credit where credit's due, that the golf swing starts before the club moves. So um, it's so interesting, the higher the handicap, the almost the more static they are at address. And then the lower handicap, especially uh, a powerful player, uh, the more you'll see the center of pressure move, even if they're not rocking back and forth, like say a Ber Berkshire. So I love that she does this. Uh, as she waggles and gets comfortable. Uh, but with Jenna, and again, she played a year on the LPGA. She's won um, two Illinois uh, Women's Opens, uh, played at South Carolina. Sorry. Um, but uh, uh, not Clemson. Yes, I, uh, send that, send I, I, her something orange. <laughs> uh, so, anyways, uh, again, she's a great trace. I, I, what you can do is you can trim that out if you didn't want to see that. But I wanted everybody to see, I, I, I'm as every bit as interested when they get on the pressure mat of what they do as they set up and every bit is what they do when they actually swing. So I just wanted to show that obviously she has a ton of speed, uh, which is why she's had so much success. We kind of determined that she had just a little bit of backup in her shorter iron. So this will be fun to take a look at. I put her on one of those pads that you use. Uh, that, so that one in particular is like the super speed one where you get on your knees and you make golf swings. So I put that under the V1 pressure mat right there, thus simulating a downhill lie. Because what I love to do, so if we're outside and I have someone that's not trapping the pressure to flight their, uh, you know, their, their scoring clubs, um, especially, a, especially a tour player or a talent like she is. So if, if she's not flighting her wedges and so on, um, I take the V1 pressure mat, I go to the front of the range where the, where the tee box kind of drops down into the range. And then I put the mat there and I make them hit uh, shots until, well, gosh, if they have any backup, they're probably going to hit the ball in the forehead, let's be honest. So um, until they start hitting it solid or they start launching it at a number that we're comfortable with. 
Uh, again, a lot of the instructors know uh, anywhere from 25 to 30 on a wedge is pretty good for a vertical launch. But if you just look here, you'll see that, and I'm gonna put her back at address. So I call this environmental education. In other words, I could explain all of this and she'd probably be talented enough to do it based off the explanation, but I'd rather, um, you know, uh, talk less and feel more. So we just simulated a, down a downhill lie indoors. And everybody, as you're watching this, the, the center of pressure is the reverse as, as you look at Jenna. So the, the lead side is still, oops, let me get that line here. The lead side is still over there, even though obviously this is her lead foot over here, just as you look at that. So because she is down uh, on a downhill, she will pressure the ground a little bit more on the lead side. Okay, she still does her golf dance move. So right as she gets going, probably almost to 70. Yeah, pretty close there. And then it went back and kind of trapped it through it. The, the backup was much more minimal. And then we just kept her going on that. And uh, it was a pretty quick and easy way to achieve the flight that we were looking for and uh, minus the backup. We, we let off with juniors and I'm sorry, I don't have any traces for you. Um, I just have the miserable millionaires on here. But, but anyways, the, uh, the, the junior traces, I mean, if, if I could start any uh, uh, beginner in golf, not even a junior, but a beginner in golf. And again, uh, this is from Chuck Cook. I would put them with high lofted clubs on down slopes. And he would even have a, uh, like a laundry line to hit underneath. And then he told me, he goes, I don't even care if they hit underneath it. <laughs> but I tell him to do that because it kind of gets them out of hanging back and trying to get under the ball or scooping, which you're going to see from any be beginning level golfer. So um, this is kind of cool. If the world struggles to get pressure to the lead side soon enough, then this is a this is kind of a go-to drill. So if you have an indoor studio, you can just put a little pad underneath the trail side like I did. Or if you are out on the range and you do have a down slope, um, and again, if the world struggles to get pressure to the lead side soon enough, this is a great way to get accomplish that. Uh, awesome. That is such a cool video to see the comparison. A few things I want to point out that Jake just taught us. Um, put stuff under your mat. Totally. The mat is flexible. It is portable. You can throw it in a bunker. You can throw it in your studio with stuff underneath it. Um, you can also put something underneath the toes to bring the toes up and get weight in the heels. So absolutely bend and move your pressure mat, put stuff under it. I've got an equestrian that puts it under a horse saddle. So uh, we've got weight lifters that have guys lifting thousands of pounds and they want to see their weight. So um, get creative. The second thing is Jake, I love that winding up. We've talked about it so many times when we're looking at long drive um, mm. uh, traces. And there is a, a Tuesday trace recording that we did with Hash where we analyzed Kyle Brookshire's, Berkshire's trace. Um, the golf dance is not moving back and forth. It is not shifting your weight or your body back and forth. Jake is showing us that we're shifting our pressure. So when you see him and you see this gal moving, she's not moving her body back and forth, she is winding up the pressure to get all of that ground force energy moving towards um, where we want it to be. So I just think that is so cool. Jake, I love that you're showing that trace. Um, Jake's playing it for us live. And so first of all, it's linear, which is beautiful. Second of all, she is absolutely, you can see her body not moving, but you can see the the trace going back and forth, which means pressure is going back and forth. That's the golf dance. That's what Kyle Brookshire, the long drivers do. That's how we're generating energy, right? To, to wind up. Um, also, Jake, there are uh, really, or Jake made a comment about club fitting. So that's another thing. Um, Mitch did a, a whole Tuesday trace about how to use the mat for club fitting. And he could see a difference in the traces based on length and shafts and all sorts of different clubs. So absolutely pull your mat out for all sorts of different things. Uh, really quickly, housekeeping, we have a couple of questions, but I wanna shout out to Liz Roland. Liz, I'm so glad you've joined us. Uh, you guys, Liz, Liz played Pinehurst yesterday. So she and I are supposed to have a chat, but she was a little bit busy playing Pinehurst. And also Albie Garb has joined us. Thanks, Albie. He's a, um, joins almost all of the webinars. Thank you for joining us. David Bosa has asked, how would you increase swing speed with pressure mat and optimum data for it? 
right? So for me, it's all always 3D ball flight verified. And uh, uh, basically, um, attack angle is just huge, as, as he knows, and, and as a lot of the instructor knows. Um, there's more benefit to, sl to slower club head speeds and to attack angle than necessarily faster club head speeds. In other words, um, that, that it almost, uh, you know, the, the average, uh, average male club head speed in this country, you know, kind of hovers around 85 to 90, it depends who you ask, right? So if, if one of them, uh, if all things considered equal, one of them hits like two degrees down, the other one hits two degrees up. I mean, the one that hit, again, all things considered equal, um, you know, that one's good. The person that's up at it might be 25 yards longer. So to answer his question, um, in terms of one speed creation, which verticals obviously does, but it does also does optimization. So if you've got a very downward attack angle, you've probably got a like a flat liner, right? In terms of verticals. So the ability to launch the lead side up in the air or the weight and unweight of the uh, lead side probably has to happen sooner. And what I would say is that uh, as much as we're talking about what happens through impact, I mean, that is a, that's basically a, an amalgamation of what happened in the backswing. So in other words, I find that with, uh, with people kind of letting them know anywhere from uh, shaft parallel back to lead arm parallel back is probably the highest amount of vertical pressure they should have on the trail side. After that, they should start moving forward. So in other words, uh, you'll see that on the V1 pressure mat with the driver, you'll see them uh, start unweighting the trail foot and pressuring the ground or the lead foot. Center of pressure still might be on the trail side, but it'll start, it, it won't be at its highest point. That gets them in their lead side sooner. That ramps up um, their vertical force under that lead leg. So that way, so again, we, we've talked about linear trace, uh, you know, and how great it is. And not necessarily with a driver, if I've got a, a downward attack angle, I want to launch that lead side up in the air as much as possible. And uh, you talked about Berkshire. I mean, there's going to be moments where he's not on the mat. And uh, we used to call that going dark. <laughs> We're not measuring you. You're not there. So, um, so if you want to launch that lead side up in the air where, you know, Justin Thomas on a, a V1 pressure mat, I believe has 96 uh, percentage points of pressure on his trail toe at impact on his driver. It's all relative. It's actually not that it's such a great amount of force. It's just that it's there's really nothing under his lead side because he got into his lead side sooner than most to uh, propel it up in the air. And again, that'll get the lead side up and that'll get the attack angle up. So that uh, the awesome. attack. That's, yeah. That's so a good answer to that question. I, would, I was also. Oh, thanks. I, well, I've done this before. Um, <laughs> 30 times, according to Bob Grissett. I was also going to say about the V1 pressure mat for 10 years. Uh, you mentioned at the top that I, uh, I'm a performance coach or the, uh, the head performance coach with Athletico Golf Performance, uh, which is a physical therapy uh, 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 franchise, especially in the Midwest, but it's all throughout the country. And um, my PTs that do the physical screening, I work with a couple of them, uh, Jeremy Smith, Dr. Jeremy Smith. Uh, he screens all my clients he has for almost 10 years, so probably... 800 clients, something like that. Well, everyone knows that is into TPI, knows the value of an overhead squat. So instead of him just doing it with his eyes, he has them go on the V1 pressure mat and has them do the, an overhead squat so he can make sure they keep their center of pressure um, in the middle. So in the middle here, right? That's not really in the middle, but that center of pressure dot, he wants it very stable as they do an overhead squat. So even during physical screens, with medical professionals, before I ever see them with a lesson, we use the V1 pressure mat for uh, physical screens. And basically off that screen, I already know what they can and can't do anyways. Awesome, that's so cool. Yeah. I love using it in different capacities, especially with physical therapy, it's so important. Especially yep. when you're working with those uh, seniors. Uh, Isaac Junker has a question that I can answer. Um, Isaac, thank you for tuning in. So you are watching Jake use the V1 Pro Mobile account. He's tapping through the graphs by tapping his screen. Um, the reason we did that is because there's just not enough real estate on the mobile devices. So if you're using the studio software, all three graphs um, are there. They're often hidden behind the windows. 
So um, if you can't find them or you don't see them, send me an email. I'll hook you up with our customer success team. They can log in and just show you how to pull those up. Um, but they're all there, just probably hidden down in the, the window. You'll see them um, to answer that question. And let's see, we had someone ask if you don't have a pressure mat drills and uh, specifically it looks like there's some kiddos some 12 or 13 year old girls that have a two handicap um and then another 13 year old kiddo that is let's see good drills without the pressure mat to get a feel for the correct rotation of the pelvis or hips yeah so uh, a few things but uh it, it's funny you can use the best technology in the world which this is and you can just find things around the house. So you already saw Petrovic with uh, with it. We, we can you imagine two golf pros could not find an alignment rod? But uh, we used the shaft. Uh, and we were at the Tour Edge in Batavia, and we just used the shaft because we could not find an alignment rod. But an alignment rod in the uh, in the belt loops, uh, I would uh, for most people, I would have most of it hang out the front. Um, if you saw that earlier with Petro, if not, I, I'll pull it back up. But um, that would be one. I use a tennis ball, which um, I have shown on previous uh, seminars. So I didn't bring that one this time, but um, a tennis ball. So you, you take a tennis ball, you take a pair of scissors to it, cut it in half, take out the core of it. And uh, you can place that wherever you want. And you talked about rotation. So I'm going to place it. Uh, and I assume you mean through the ball. So I'm going to place that tennis ball, tennis ball underneath the lead toe and I'm gonna squash it all the way in my backswing. And then I'm gonna let off it all the way in my downswing. And I did that with Brian Finnerty on the very first one. So, um, and then what you'll know is they'll pressure the ground because they'll build up that force, uh, you know, in the toe outward to propel their pressure backward into their heel, which will open up their lead side more. So yeah, uh, uh, alignment rods and uh, and tennis balls. Uh, you know, both of those are what dollar fifty. So. Hey, hey, Jake, you're gonna love this. So I have an I have another drill suggestion for you. Okay. So Darcy Dillon uses a a tool, a, a training aid under the left foot as well, like you know to get um, to get you to know, weight there, and he uses a squeaky dog toy. So he yep. puts a squeaky yeah. dog toy, so you have to hear it. You know, you have to squeak it at the right time. So squeaky dog toys, I, tennis balls, pool noodles, you know, whatever works, right? I, I remember when uh, Ledbetter did that. And then I, <laughs> uh, uh, in the nineties in, in a golf digest article, and then I was driving my dog nuts, um, <laughs> trying to get to my lead side <laughs> sooner. Cause that was harped on me as a junior golfer, get, get into your lead side. And to be honest with you, yeah, we know a little bit more, but to be honest, I, I was given, uh, some bad advice in my life, but that, but I, I can't really criticize that one. Getting into the lead side as soon as possible. That's all verified with the pressure map. That's awesome. what the best players do. Yeah. Awesome. So I got Kevin Streelman here and I got two okay. different drills. I got him on a little board. Um, unfortunately, this was, this was taken and I just talked to him actually two days ago and he was uh, uh, also reached out and uh, he, he went down to Naples and saw Dr. Suddy who I know is a, um, a big, uh, big V1 guy. Yeah, uh, big, uh, we'll call him a V1 emeritus at this point. He's like um, the godfather. That, he's like the yes. godfather. Yes. Um, he is, uh, he's certainly my golf father, but um, so anyways, uh, uh, I remember gr growing up watching Dr. Suddy's uh, V1 videos and trying to learn even before I ever met him. But uh, so this was Kevin back in the fall. And then I just spoke to him the other day and we were talking about some similar stuff um, that uh, that he was talking about with Doc as well. And so um, he, you know, perhaps got some uh, advice that didn't work for him. So um, I've seen this on the internet. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it where you kind of turn out of your trail hip a little bit. And uh, you can see actually for as good as he is um, that there was this little backup as he was transitioning back to the trail side and uh you know he's basically trying to turn out of his uh his trail hip from the top of the swing and not move forward um i think that can be a wonderful feel for the overly lateral player but the reality is that the pelvis moves laterally and um and again if he's in front of me he wasn't hitting it that great so i uh, and i 
as he said on the phone the other night, he goes, no one knows my trace like you, Jake. And that's probably true. That's probably an indictment of my own nerdery. So at first I put him on the chef thick pressure board, which again is very simple. Uh, this pretty easy build anyways, to just kind of get it down uh, sooner rather than later. It was funny, even for him with that advice, that board would kind of squiggle on him on his downswing and he would lose his balance. Uh, but again, as good as he is, he picked it up within a matter of swings. And then here is the after right here. And then I got one more drill that I showed him doing for his wedges, but um, here's the after. So you can see, uh, and this is basically downswing. So no backup anymore, right? Nice. So that's from the top of the swing all the way down. Um, again, just shows you how talented these, these people are. Um, a common uh, mistake that uh, not only does he get into, but a lot of tour players get into is uh, since they do rotate the pelvis in the backswing, sometimes they get too deep into the heel. So I got one more drill for you guys, if you will permit me. And here it is. So uh, uh, you cannot hang out with, um, you cannot hang out with, oh, come on work. Hold on one sec. Nope, I'll go back. I'll just say yes. Okay, so you cannot be around PTs all day and not be into like TheraBands and, uh, and foam rollers and all that kind of stuff. I watch, in between lessons, I watch physical therapy all day like a hawk and just watch basic human movement and then try to incorporate stuff in. So this is a TheraBand. Um, sitting there, uh, for him, it's around his thighs and stuff. We were trying to activate, uh, for the kinesiology nerds out there, his glute medial. Um, basically, uh, most people know about the glute max, but the glute medial is a muscle that contracts that rotates the ball socket joint. So anyways, you did, if you've ever put a TheraBand around your knees and done some duck walks, trust me, that's what you were feeling was a uh, glute medial strength. So this was just for his wedges, and he was a little bit overly lateral and too much into the, um, the heel too soon. So in other words, he was twisting his hips right off the ball. So I told him to kind of feel like the band was taunt for, for a hot second there. So he kind of felt like he was giving the club a little bit of a head start, and he was very stable. And then at the top, you can see he did get into his heel. It was uh, 70, 72% right there. So basically he had to feel like he held it uh, in, during his takeaway. And then he allowed the pelvis to rotate back. And that way, uh, I believe he was loading about 90 or so percent. Again, he was just twisting his hips right off the ball. This gave him a little bit more load of the trail side in the backswing. So something as simple as that, that's going to be something you use with better players. Better players are going to try to cheat on it a little bit. They're going to get a little out of sequence and they're going to twist their hips off the ball. You want to make sure that they load that side first before they rotate it, um, so on and so forth. So, um, awesome. and then that, yeah, that chef thick pressure board I have put uh, that you see right behind him. Uh, I have put that under the mat uh, just uh, pretty much with a lot of amateurs. Again, this is a really flat uh, range. This is one of my uh, golf academies. So we don't have a downslope. So I've put the V1 pressure mat on the chef thick pressure board and basically got him loading sides, probably for the first time if they're a new golfer. And uh, my buddy Jason Sutton says, oh, I'm stealing that. So I love when he <laughs> tags me on Instagram doing that with the uh, pressure map. I love it. All right, All a couple right. more quick questions. Marcella, I'm Marcella I'm what? Yeah, I'm coming back can, to you, just so you know. You can, yeah, you can totally do that. And I actually wanna do a quick share in a second if the girls will give me permission. Uh, Marcella has a cool question. Marcella is a part of our customer success team. If you guys have heard me brag about them, it's only getting better with Marcella on the team. Anyway, she's asked a great question. What is the biggest breakthrough you've seen an athlete walk away with after using the V1 pressure mat in your lesson? Uh, so to answer, you know, it's very hard to answer um, uh, questions universally that are multivariable, but I'll do my best. Um, the thing that the... Whatever, yeah, the old, yeah, no, no, it's, that's, that's why it's a good question. Um, yeah. So the, it's the, the best thing about the mat is to be able to quantify their feel. There's a lot of devices out there. 
okay, um, uh, that measure various things. But the one feedback that I always get from clients is that, um, you know, they always say feel is not real, but when you tell them to push down on their lead side, I've never seen someone push down on their trail side. Um, and I don't care what their uh, skill level is currently in golf. And when you ask them to push down on their toes, I've never seen someone push down on their heels. So when it comes to the V1 pressure mat, feel is real, especially when you do it in the biofeedback. So it's very cool to quantify their feel. Um, and, uh, and I find that the transference of that feel is almost immediate as opposed to uh, just do this and uh, we'll check it next time. Um, again, uh, you do a little bit biofeedback with them. Uh, whenever you bring attention to the movement, the movement always improves because of the awareness has now improved. And that's really the first step towards learning. I love it. So after talking to 33 golf instructors who are pressure mat experts, I would say as an instructor, you cannot see pressure without a mat. So within one lesson of talking about it with your student, you can at least have a conversation about it because you know what you're talking about, right? It's, it's data. It's not um, opinion. So I think that's part of it as well. Um, just a few minutes left, but Kevin's asked, what happens when we get into the lead side too early? Sure. So um, basically uh, you're going to have to back up because you can't have, you have no prep way of trapping that pressure forward. So typically when you get in the lead side too early, typically that is a better player's problem. Assuming that it's a problem, that's, that's the disclaimer there because I have seen too many Z traces and backup traces that absolutely bomb it. And I would need two drivers to reach it. So um, again, it's always ball flight verified. If you don't prove the ball flight, you don't prove the golfer. Um, but to, to their point, yes, a, an elite level player can get into the lead side too soon causing backup when they're not wanting to do so. Um, usually uh, with an iron, especially a scoring club, and that can come at a price. The price can be the uh, inconsistency of the low point and the inconsistency of the trajectory. In other words, they probably launch it a little bit higher and spinnier than they expected. Nice, thank you. That's a great answer as well. Um, I'm gonna do a quick, quick, actually Marcella said something fun. She said, it's, it's not uh, feel versus real. She said, see the feel. The pressure mat lets you see the feel. I like that. It does. Hey, you guys, really quickly, Jake, you're going to love this. So I, while we talked about um, your uh, drill, your cheek checker, can you see this picture? Yeah. This is yeah, Jim beautiful. Altamirano's studio. And so he saw the pressure or the Tuesday trace where you built this cheek checker and he, this is his studio. He built one. So he sent me, you guys, this is, this is a home studio with a pressure mat. This guy, Jim Altamirano, my buddy is by far a bigger golf nut than most of you i promise <laughs> anyway i love that he takes he watches our traces and and he's taking your your advice absolutely to heart because there he has created your cheap checker drill barrier right there i had to show you guys i just got that text during our trace so anyway thanks jim for tuning in and i had to I had to show you that john uh that Jake. that is a that is an oldie but a goodie but the good news is with the latest technology you can prove the genius of these drills that, that, that have been around since, since basically we started swinging golf clubs. I mean, people were putting chairs back there, but now you can actually show why it's good. So yeah. uh, Jim, I'm humbled that that looks awesome. And you can also hang uh, like wet clothes on it too, which is what <laughs> I do. I do that and I put it also on my Peloton. Yeah, not I just in, not in Jim. Off of. The only person allowed in Jim Altamirano's golf studio is Jim Altamirano. So I promise there's no laundry going on in there. Um, Jake, thank you so much for joining me tonight. You guys, uh, the girls put Jake's contact information in the chat. If you would like to get in contact with Jake or have a lesson with him, you can go to jaketherm.com. Um, that's where you can schedule a lesson or send him a video. And thanks so much for everyone joining us tonight. Uh, Mandy.vonc at V1 Sports. If you have questions or are interested in any of our products or just to say hi, I would love it. And Jake, I hope you'll join me again sometime soon. Of course I will. I loved it. <laughs> we love you. Thanks for being a V1 partner and family member. Have so much fun. Appreciate it. Love you guys. See ya. Cheers. Cheers.